Hi there. My name is Michael and I serve as the preaching pastor here at Redemption Hill Church. It is joyful for us. It is a great joy for us to be able to put out these gospel-centered resources. So whether they are messages or blog posts or videos uh, that help you, we pray that they will uh, spur you forward as uh, believers in Christ to be more like Jesus and to serve in the building of his kingdom. But may I add a word of caution, which is that you would not use these resources, however, as a replacement for your commitment to the local church and your submission to local church elders. For God has appointed elders as shepherds over your souls. And the church is instituted by Christ as the means by which you mature in him. And so we believe in the local church and we believe that God uses the local church and it is the will of God that you be part of a local church. And so may this resource bless you and encourage you and bless your church and encourage your church, but by no means replace your, uh, the much needed commitment uh, that you must have towards your local church. May the Lord bless you and keep you and may this resource bless you abundantly. In Jesus' name. Today's sermon will be one of severe desperation and uh, complete confidence. Uh, severe desperation because uh, when you have to preach about God, uh, when you have to preach about God, you always find that whenever it comes to the subject of glory, when it comes to the subject of beauty, when it comes to the subject, subject of quote-unquote unfathomable, a preacher always struggles. He is desperate. He is desperate in two ways. He is desperate to understand it himself and he is desperate because he has to communicate it well enough to help his people understand but I come with confidence. I come with confidence because it is not the strength of the preacher that saves. It is not the words of the preacher that strengthen. It is not the articulation of the preacher that changes or transforms the heart. It is the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is able to change your heart from the very simplest of things that can happen in this room. From the verse in a song, from the posture of a man, to the re reading of the word, to a word in a prayer, to a testimony that was shared, he is able to take the smallest of things and change your life once and for all, let alone a full sermon. So my confidence is that he is able to do this and that I am not. So you will find me being both desperate and confident at the same time. So let's strap in and go. We have a lot of ground to cover for so little of us. We are in the process of understanding the nature, the characteristic, the revelation and the manifestation of the kingdom of heaven. What is this kingdom? What is the kingdom of heaven? And we're trying to understand that. And its simplest and most basic way, a kingdom is, uh, a kingdom is a people that is ruled by their king and that kingdom has whatever the people build, whatever the land owns, whatever the property has, the dominion of the kingdom will cover the people, what the people possess, what is given to the people and that kingdom is ruled by its king. It's the simplest what a kingdom is, right? You don't need a lot of definitions for what a typical kingdom looks like. But when you say the kingdom of heaven, we know that the king is Jesus. We know that he is the king of kings and the lord of lords. And we know the dominion of this king reaches as far as the ends of the universe and beyond. There is no place. I like how Abraham Kuyper, if you don't know who he is, you should Google him. Very interesting fellow. Abraham Kuyper once said that there is no square inch on this universe upon which Jesus will not cry, 
mine. It all belongs to him. It all belongs to him. And so this king and his dominion is over all. And his kingdom is being realized and manifest from the day he came. From the day Jesus came, he has been saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of God is upon you. Why? The king has come. The king has come down from the glories of heaven, born of human flesh, Jesus, God incarnate. And where the king goes, his kingdom follows. And he has come to establish his kingdom on the earth. And we've been studying about the nature and the characteristics of this kingdom to understand it better. Chapter 13 of Matthew's gospel account is reserved for this revelation. And Jesus is committed to giving it in parables. And he gave us his intention. His disciples asked him, why do you speak in parables? And in verse 11, he said, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. These are selective revelations reserved for the saints and obscured for the unbelieving world. It is confusing for them, but liberating for us. For they cannot understand what's happening, but we can. And so it is revelation for us and concealing for them. And so we've been in this journey. We've been studying different parts of this. But now we are given two parables here that are so simple that you are forced to wonder what could it possibly obscure. When Jesus spoke about the parable of the sower, his own disciples came and said, what does it mean? When Jesus spoke about the parable of the weeds, Jesus' disciples came and said, what does that mean? But now you are given two parables that are absolutely clear, so simple that it forces you to ask the question, what is it possibly obscuring? The first parable, verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. So a man finds a treasure in a field and he upon finding it, covers it. Why does he cover it? Because he doesn't want it to be stolen from him. He doesn't want it to be taken away from him. So he covers it. He covers that treasure and he goes and sells everything he has with joy to buy this one treasure because he won't lose it. What could it possibly obscure? That's a very simple and clear parable. That's what the kingdom of heaven is worth. Or the second parable, verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So a merchant, a merchant of fine pearls, is always on the search for pearls, looking for pearls. And when he finds one pearl of great value, he sells everything else he has and buys it. That seems clear. A man in search of truth seeks and searches truth all over the globe and upon finding the gospel, the truth, the real truth, goes and sells everything else he has and buys this because it's of great value. What could possibly these two parables obscure? And I'm convinced given in these two clearly understandable parables is the mightiest of revelations concealed. And sadly, that revelation is not just obscured from people outside the church, it's obscured from many within the church as well. We've already covered several of the parables and have seen the nature and manifestation of this kingdom, of how God intends to build this kingdom on earth. But these parables we have before us are about worth or glory. Not to reveal how or what the kingdom, the how or the what of the kingdom, but to reveal the why, the why of this kingdom. Why is it of great value? You are shifting here from characteristics to substance. You are shifting to something deeper. 
and although it is perceivable on the outside, here are two parables that we can entirely miss the depths from. Only the Holy Spirit can illumine our hearts to the power and glory beneath the flood of these parables. And personally, I find again such sermons, sermons of this nature, the most needed in our time and consequently the hardest to preach. Because how can a man comprehend, let alone speak about the glories of heaven? How can I tell you the worth of heaven? How is that possible? How can I grasp the worth of heaven? I'll tell you what heaven is for most of us. Heaven is the place we want to go in order to get away from our struggles in life. Heaven is, and I've often said that, heaven is never our objective goal, it's our reactionary goal. Heaven is the place where we want to go so that our tears are wiped away. Heaven is the place we want to go because we want to get rid of all the problems of this world. But the Bible does not talk about heaven as a refugee camp. Bible talks about heaven as home. Bible talks about heaven as the end, the goal, the aim, the purpose. So how can we look to heaven and see heaven for all it's worth? And because we don't see heaven for all it's worth, we are forced to believe in heaven through all these reactionary means. And so given in these two verses, brothers and sisters, I want you to think about that. Heaven is of such great worth and value that it is greater than the greatest worth and value you've seen. And it is so great that you will want to sell everything you have to, just to have that. So think about the things that are of great value to, to you. And you would with joy, gladly sell it all for the sake of the one. This is unfathomable speech, quotes. This is the speech that's talking about the horizon that you can see on the surface level, a parable that seems pretty clear about what it's trying to tell you, but you just can't plunge the depths of it. Why? Because how do you understand the value of heaven? The whole point of the parable is not to tell you heaven has great value, it is to show you just how much value it has. And that is exactly what we cannot grasp. Or can we? Apart from the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, this sermon is a futile endeavor amongst all sermons. All sermons are a futile endeavor without the Holy Spirit, but this most of all. So Lord, I pray that you would show yourself strong for your people. Open our minds to the glory of your kingdom and let us not be the same. Lord Jesus, do not leave us unchanged. You are in this place where two or more are gathered. Renew our minds and transform our hearts in the hearing of your word. Do this, Lord Jesus, for the glory of your name. So we start with verse 34. All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. So in keeping with his intention, Jesus did not speak anything to the crowds without a parable. Why? Because it's obscured from them. Now remember, who are this crowd? This crowd, as we know from the context, is the crowd that kept gathering around him and they were the people of his own hometown. People who were rejecting and questioning all of his actions. Legalists bound up in law in an unholy way who could not see the glory before their eyes for they subscribed to an ungodly man-made adherence to the laws and the prophets. These were the Pharisees. These people were devoted to the law but could not see the law incarnate. These people were devoted to the, to the law of God but could not see the God before their eyes. They were a people like we see in 2 Timothy 3.7 always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. They went so far as to accuse Jesus in this chapter of being the prince of demons as a way to discredit his power of healing and driving out demons. This crowd would not, therefore, 
would not be privileged of hearing the truths about God's kingdom. This crowd would not get Jesus to clearly speak about the kingdom. He would only give it to them in parables. They who turned God's revelation into a legalistic rod would be given the judgment of mystery. Here is the revelation, God incarnate, clouding the revelation of his kingdom in mystery using parables. He would not speak to them a thing, the scripture tells us, without a parable. Such is God's intention with those who harden their hearts to his word and his work. He clouds their judgment. Those who reject Christ scatters. Let us remember Hebrews 3, 15 to 19. As it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For those who were, for who were, who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did we swear that... To whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of their unbelief. So let us not be like them. In fact, the last verse of Matthew 13 reads, And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. God spoke in parables to conceal from such a people the revelation he wanted to give. And Matthew tells us in verse 35, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables and I will utter that what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. Matthew does this a lot. Matthew loves narrating the story of Jesus and constantly bringing out how it fulfills prophecies of the Old Testament. And so we come here and Jesus speaking in parables to these people was a fulfillment of prophecy. Which is very interesting, is it not? <coughs> Matthew regards what is happening here as a fulfillment of Psalm 78. A Psalm of Asaph. And herein, maybe we may find better reason for understanding this parabolic, this parables, parabolic nature of Jesus' message on the kingdom. Perhaps, if we look at Psalm 78, it may give us a glimpse as to why the value of the message of these parables, the, what they conceal, is of such great value. Maybe Psalm 78 is kind of the key that unlocks more to seeing what this is. And so Psalm 78 is where we are going to be today. It is a very long psalm. So I'm not going to go verse by verse. I'm going to break it up into chunks. I'm going to jump. I'm going to somersault, do a lot of stuff. But be exegetical as much as I can. This psalm, which Matthew says is being fulfilled by what Jesus is doing is a historic psalm <coughs> because it recounts events in history of Israel's disobedience, disbelief and God's perseverance. It is a long psalm. So I want to take sections of it and show you how Asaph recounts the story of God's people in this poem. Psalm 78, 1 to 3. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. That's the beginning of Psalm 78. The psalmist beseeches his people to hear his words carefully. For though he hopes to recite to them the history of Israel, his prayer remains that the ears of his people would hear more than history. The psalmist's first instruction is incline your ear. Don't just sing this song. Don't just read its history. Incline your ear. 
move closer get a closer look look deep there's something here I'm going to tell you something but there's something deep and you need to incline your ear in order to see it and so he begins with that instruction the study of history does not require careful attention it just requires attention there's nothing complicated about history history is what happened history dictates what happened but the call of Asaph here draws us to look more than what is on the surface to incline our ears I will open my mouth in a parable I will utter dark sayings from of old this lesson in history was going to be a parable he calls it dark sayings from of old and this was a way of talking about mysteries or riddles or enigmatic sayings so he's going to speak in a parable and there is a mystery to this poem and that's what he's inviting his people to incline your ear there's a mystery to this poem that I'm about to sing in fact I was trying to find a way to articulate it and when you run out of words of articulation you just quote Spurgeon and this is what Spurgeon spoke of this is what he said I will utter dark sayings of old enigmas of antiquity riddles of yore the mind of the poet prophet was so full of ancient lore that he poured it forth in a copious stream of song I'll read very slowly listen to what Spurgeon is saying the mind of the poet prophet Asaph was so full of ancient lore ancient tradition ancient truth that he poured it forth in a copious stream of song while beneath the glushing flood lay pearls and gems of spiritual truth capable of enriching those who could dive into the depths and bring them up for anyone who goes to Psalm 73 and rides the stream on a boat, you miss everything. 78, sorry. You miss everything. And what Spurgeon is saying, beneath this flood of song are pearls of great value. And you have to plunge the depths of it and bring it up. The letter of this song is precious but the inner sense is beyond all price Spurgeon continues whereas the first verse called for attention incline your ear the second justifies the demand by hinting that the outer sense conceals an inner and hidden meaning which only the thoughtful will be able to perceive what a beginning to a psalm I'm captivated I'm curious I want to know he's going to talk about things which he says things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us this knowledge was his, his inheritance it was passed on to him from the generations that came before him <coughs> now in the next verse before we plunge into it this is the introductory part of his song in the next verse we find Asaph's intention in writing the psalm why is he writing this what's his purpose and it gives us a profound insight into how this man thought about this song verse 4 we will not hide them from their children but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done so his intention is generations his intention is to sing the song and for this song to be sung through generations that the mystery and pearls that lie beneath the gush of flood of this history would flow forth in song from generation to generation preserving the truth within there is a generational intention behind the way the Israelites carried the message of their God and sadly this kind of thought is lost in so many of us who are drowned entirely in the present age 
we think only about ourselves and we think only about our families today and we think only about our surroundings today. In fact, this generational tradition was not a man-made edict. As we see the verses following, tell us, verse 5, verse 5 to verse 8. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers. So God gave a law, God gave a testimony, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children. That was the command of God, to teach to their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children. So that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. So if you want generational commitment to God's sovereignty, you pass the truth. You teach the truth. And Asaph was committed. He was going to write a song. And that song was going to carry generations. Have you ever thought of writing a song that carries generations? Have you ever thought of preaching a sermon that carries generations? Have you ever thought of making an impact for generations? It was God's divine intention that his testimony and his law be preserved and taught from generation to generation. It is a command of God that each generation be responsible for equipping the one that follows in order that the children yet unborn may arise and tell them to their children. Beloved, what we do today matters not only for our congregants and our families, but for families that will come from our families. Our people are not only those, when we say our people, our people are not only those we see around us, but those that are going to come out from us. What we do today matters for generations to come. As the kingdom of heaven, like we saw last week, rises from the earth like a mustard seed sprouting and growing into a tree, every generation teaches the foundation that has been laid. Every generation builds on top of the foundation that was already laid. And this teaching helps generations set their hope in God and not forget his works. So their commitment to God, their remembrance of who he is, their their ability to remember so that they don't forget his works are preserved through this tradition of passing and teaching the glory of God. Therefore, this parabolic song, this enigmatic sayings, these dark sayings were meant to carry deep insights across generation and it has now come to us in the 21st century of this age, of this world. So many generations have passed since that song was written. And now it has come to us. What will we do with it? Will we read it in our morning devotions and forget it immediately with a swift amen? Or will we sing this song to our children so that they may sing it to their children and their children may sing it to theirs? And so he begins his song. <coughs> Verses 9 to 11. The Ephraimites, armed with bow, turned the back on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant, but refused to walk according to his law. They forget his works and the wonders that he had shown them. The psalmist starts from the Ephraimites' failure. And Ephraim was the son of Joseph. And it's the tribes of Joseph. It's the tribes that come. So these are Ephraimites, the different tribes. And if you read Judges 1, you begin to see how all these tribes were named. 
and how these tribes, what they did. And Ephraim had a failure. They failed in the conquest of Canaan at the end of God's promised deliverance of Israel from Egypt. God brought them finally to the land of promise. The wilderness time is over and they come into the land of Canaan and Joshua has died and Israel looks to God and the people look to God and God gives them his covenant, God gives them his promises and they failed because they failed to keep his covenant in conquering Canaan. So the psalmist starts with Ephraim and you'll find through the psalm he makes, he starts with Ephraim which is the concluding part of the journey from Egypt to Canaan and then he goes all the way from Egypt to Canaan through the time of the wilderness to show just how much disobedience has been there and it, and it concluded even with disobedience. So he starts here and he goes all the way. However, it was not just the tribe of Ephraim that failed to keep God's covenant. In Judges 1, we are told that the tribe of Manasseh, Zebulun, Asher and Naphtali were all guilty of the same. They did not conquer the land. That in the day, on the day of battle, armed with bow, they turned their back. They refused to walk. It wasn't a lack of strength or armor that prevented the tribes of Israel from conquering Canaan as the Lord had instructed them. It was disobedience. It was rebellion. It was a refusal that arose and we are told where it arose from. From a forgetfulness of God's mighty works and wonders. So understand what the psalmist is trying to say. You teach this song from generation to generation so that they will not forget. Why? Let me tell you how much we forgot. And he starts with Ephraim's failure. And he says, they turned away because they forgot his works and wonders. This was the act of a generation purely taught the ancient lore of God's glory. You see what they forgot here. They didn't forget the law because they knew the law. The law was still there with them. They still followed the edicts of the law. Then what did they forget? We are not told that they forgot the law. We are told that they forgot God's works and wonders. They knew the law and they chose to disobey that law. They rejected it because the law in and of itself was weakened by the flesh of man. For it could not save. But what they forgot was the glory of God manifest his works and his wonders. How often are we ourselves satisfied in the surface of doctrine oblivious to the glories underneath? How often do we ourselves conform to tradition and polity without drinking of the unsurpassable awe that flows from the river of its truth? How often do we find proud Christians who are proud about all the wrong things? It does us no good to know the doctrines of God while being ignorant of God's glory. And that's precisely what those two parables are going to do for us. The kingdom of heaven is of great value and it is like you sell everything and you buy it. Doctrinally understood. Theological checkbox tick. Gives you nothing if you cannot see exactly how valuable it is. So having spoken about Ephraim's failure, the psalmist then begins to give us glimpses of God's glories and that glories are full in Psalm 78 that even if I just take that and try to plunge into the depths of it, we won't finish. But some we will take. Psalm 78 verses 12 to 16. In the sight of their fathers, whose fathers? Ephraim, Manasseh, all the tribes. In the sight of their fathers, he performed wonders in the land of Egypt, in the fields of Zoan. 
He divided the sea and let them and let them pass through it and made the water stand like a heap. In the daytime he led them with a cloud and all the night with a fiery light. He split rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. He made streams come out of the rock and caused waters to flow down like rivers. History. It means nothing that you know this if you cannot see the glory behind it. We are not to read these events as mere history but to see the power of God manifest. I want you to see something here. The power of gravity and the laws of physics parted ways and the fluid dynamics of the river withdrew in silence for the first time and the waters stacked on top of each other till they formed a heap on either side to make way for God's people to pass through it. Have you ever tried stacking water on water? The science that governs the world was silent. They would not raise a voice. They would not shout. They were all silent and they withdrew to allow God to raise the waters like heaps on either side for the people to pass through. What do you see there? An event in history or are you seeing glory? Are you seeing power? Are you seeing majesty? He raised a cloud as his chariot and instructed it to lead the way for the people during the day. And guess what? It did so against the wind. You have a cloud that's leading the people and it's leading the people through the wilderness. It's turning when it has to turn and often against the wind and it does so because God instructed it. When every other cloud was tossed to and fro by every wind, this one stayed its course unhindered. Do you see glory there or do you see history? He rained a fiery light, a pillar of heat to guard them by night. An aberration so magnificent, it was like a tornado on fire. I want you to picture that. A deadly sight that was the greatest comfort to the Israelites. From out of the dry rock where there was no water, he made rivers flow. The Lord cut a path for his people through the mountain and nothing could hinder them. He did not choose a path for them so as to avoid obstacles and dangers. He chose a path through them and his hand was resolved to keep them. <coughs> what is forgotten here, beloved? It is this God who has made our bodies his temple where his Holy Spirit dwells. And now, in this present age, we feel forced to compromise on our Christian values because we've bought into the lie that God is unable. We give in to bribes saying there is no way around it. We give in to depression because we cannot see hope. We keep silent in the face of injustice because we find ourselves too weak. Let the glory of this God dawn upon your minds today. So the psalmist wants us to see beneath the history. See the power. See the glory. The psalmist then traces this disobedience and rebellion of Israel throughout their journey through the wilderness. He starts with Ephraim and he goes throughout. When they doubted his ability to provide them food in a barren wilderness, in Psalm 78, 20 we read, He struck the rock so that water gushed out and streams over, overflowed. And the people then asked, can he also provide meat? 
they are in a barren wilderness where there is no scope for food there is only scope for death their fears are justified if all, all you see is the wilderness but what made their fears so vile was that there was a cloud leading them against the wind and a tornado of fire guarding them by night what made their disbelief so horrible was that god was with them and he they would not trust him and so when they questioned him of these things we read in verses 23 to 29 He commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven and he rained down on them manna to eat and gave them grain from heaven verse 25 man ate the bread of angels he sent them food in abundance he caused the east wind to blow in the heavens and by his power he led out the south wind He rained meat on them like dust, winged birds like the sand of the sea. He let them fall in the midst of their camp all around their dwellings, and they ate and were well filled, for he gave them what they craved. The grain of heaven rained down on them. This wasn't a scientific phenomenon, it was a supernatural phenomenon. At his command, food poured out of the heavens in abundance onto a barren land of hungry people. This is not the kingdoms of this earth riding on helicopters throwing out food to refugees that's not what's happening here they're trying to feed as many people as they can heaven explodes and food falls man ate the bread of angels need i say more we have heard that the wind blows where it pleases but we were wrong the wind blows where he pleases he led the wind and rained the meat like dust winged birds as many as the sand of the sea these creatures were caught in a tide of wind that they could not escape when god cast a net made of wind in the skies and gathered all the birds and pulled them in for the meat for his people In fact he didn't just let them fall he caused them to fall in the midst of the camp all around their dwellings Do you see history a fancy fable or do you see glory Do you see power and it is he who now dwells inside of you He provided not only for their needs but also for their cravings and yet in verse 22 we read because they did not believe in God and did not trust his saving power Can you imagine the lack of belief As the psalmist continues to chronicle the disbelief and rebellion of the Israelites he talks about God's judgment on them for their continued rejection verses 34 to 37 when he killed them they sought him they repented and sought God earnestly they remembered that God was their rock they remembered finally forgetfulness and finally they remembered the most high God their redeemer but they flattered him with their mouths they lied to him with their tongues their heart was not steadfast toward him they were not faithful to his covenant even in their suffering they knew that god was their redeemer but yet their heart was not faithful to his covenant and here we are told in verses 38 to 43 with all that god was doing for them with all the glories manifest in verses 38 to 43 here's what it says yet he being compassionate atoned for their iniquity and did not destroy them he restrained his anger often and did not stir up all his wrath he remembered that they were but flesh a wind that passes and comes not again how often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert 
they tested God again and again and provoked the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember His power. Again, here we go. They did not remember His power or the day when He redeemed them from the foe, when He performed His signs in Egypt and His marvels in the fields of Zoan. They could not remember His power. Though they acknowledged His presence, held his law in their lips and submitted to the tradition and ordinances given to them, their hearts were not steadfast toward him. They did not recognize the God behind the miracles. They weren't getting the bigger picture. And forgetfulness was their greatest curse. But God, mighty in power, mighty in glory, is also mighty in compassion. He atoned for their iniquity, restrained his wrath and did not destroy them. If the Old Testament ever looks to you as the history of God's wrath, it was not. It was the history of God's wrath restrained. That's what it was. It was God holding back. Following the psalmist writing, we see that the captivity of Israel under Egypt initially and their later captivity to pagan kingdoms because God judged them for their disbelief were all avenged. God not only preserved Israel but judged them and then faithfully saved them and then destroyed the nations that he used to judge them. He loved them. In verses 44 to 51, we read, He turned their rivers to blood so that they could only drink of their streams. He sent among them swarms of flies which devoured them and frogs which destroyed them. He gave their crops to the destroying locusts and the fruit of their labor to the locusts. He destroyed their vines with hail with, and their sycamores with frost. He gave over their cattle to the hail and the flocks to thunderbolts. He let loose on them his burning anger, wrath, indignation and distress, a company of destroying angels. He made a path for his anger. He did not spare them from death, but gave their lives over to the plague. He struck down every firstborn of Egypt, the first fruits of their strength in the tents of Ham. So you have in Psalm 78 the display of the history of Israel redemption from Egypt and their journey through the wilderness and their coming to the promised land of Canaan. And he's constantly telling us, look beneath the history, see the glory, see the power, see the majesty, see the magnificence. That is the God whom we serve. And this parabolic poem of the psalmist climaxes with David. Psalm 78, 67 to 72. He rejected the tent of Joseph. He did not choose the tribe of Ephraim, but he chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loves. He built his sanctuary like the high heavens, like the earth, which he has founded forever. He chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds, from, fo from following the nursing ewes. He brought him to shepherd Jacob his people, Israel his inheritance. With upright heart he shepherded them and guided them with his skillful hand. Brothers and sisters, there is a true and better Psalm 78. A true and better Psalm 78 that we can sing today as saints of the New Testament because our singing of this song does not culminate in David. Our singing of this song culminates in Jesus Christ. And in the reference, in referencing parabolic Psalm 78, Matthew is inviting us to do that. Matthew is inviting us to see the story completed in the parables of Christ. The song of Asaph that he began to sing in Psalm 78 was not concluded by Asaph. It was concluded by Christ in Matthew chapter 13. From the parable that began, Christ is concluding those parables. God took David from the sheepfolds where he was nursing lambs and brought him to shepherd Israel. 
and even David's kingdom fell into ruins after him. God's judgment followed Israel always for they continually rebelled even after David's time. David was not their salvation. And the pattern we see from Egypt to David continued on throughout generations. For as much as God's power was manifest among them, their greatest enemy was not the pagan nations around them or each other, but sin. Their greatest enemy was the serpent of old who tempted their minds with the cares of this world and led them down the path of forgetfulness. The devil deceived the nations. So God, in fulfilling his promise to his people, sent his only begotten son, not from the sheepfolds of Israel, but from the kingdom of heaven. He who walked among angels came to walk among his people. God himself came down to man and where the king goes, his kingdom follows. And he came to lead his people, to shepherd his people by saving them, not from Egypt, but from the dominion of sin. He came to break the curse of sin and death. He came to defeat an enemy that could not be defeated by man. He came to defeat sin. And he came to die to buy our freedom. He came to set us free so that we can obey and love him. He came to deal with our forgetfulness and he did so by instituting the remembrance of his table that we may not forget. Beloved, we are now free from the captivity of sin to follow the same God of Israel in all his glory given to us in his promises and his rule and his power is the glory of God manifest in the face of Jesus Christ. This Jesus is the treasure of unfathomable value. This Jesus is the pearl of unsurpassable worth. And we who find him find his kingdom. And it is more worth than anything this world has to offer you. And the only way that we can come away from these two parables, understanding what it says, is to understand just how valuable, just how worth the kingdom of God is. And so these two parables, of the whole lot of parables, for me, obscures the most. For although they seem simple and clear and direct, you cannot in your human strength understand the worth and value of that kingdom. But by the power of the Spirit, through the work of Jesus Christ, through the doors of the cross, through the scars in his hands, through the price that he paid, through the ransom that he paid, through the salvation that he purchased for you, there is but one way, one truth, one life, and that is in Christ Jesus. And through him, may God open the doors of your hearts to see the worth of our Savior and His Kingdom and may you give your lives for the glory of that Kingdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Gracious Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. We thank you so much for your kindness and mercy to us. Fill us now and lead us as your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.